Welcome to From Amiens to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director for the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, Professor Sir Hugh Strong considers the Battle of Amiens and its outcome. My name's Hugh Strawn. I'm Professor of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. In my first podcast, I talked about the Battle of Amiens in the context of the First World War as a whole. In this podcast, I'm going to look at the battle itself, its preparation, its execution and its effects. In 1918, there were three men, Douglas Haig, Henry Rawlinson, Ferdinand Foch, who found themselves in the right place at the right time, and who coordinated their actions despite the differences in approach that they possessed to extraordinary effect. On the 26th of March 1918, Ferdinand Foch had been given the responsibility of coordinating the actions of the British and the French armies in response to a major German offensive which had been launched five days earlier on the Somme sector. That was the first of what were to prove to be five German offensives between March and July 1918, in which first the British army and then the French army had taken significant losses and had been considerably battered. The last of those offensives was launched on the 15th of July on the River Marne. It was a battle which the French in many respects were prepared for. They did not try to hold it frontally and instead strengthened their positions to the rear, creating the effect for the Germans of marching into a sack and also creating the opportunity for the French to mount a counterattack. This was the moment for which Foch, the Allied Supreme Commander, had been waiting. Throughout the previous offensives, the national commanders wanted to launch their own independent counterattacks And he'd had to say, earlier in the war, we launched too many isolated attacks against which the Germans could concentrate their reserves. We need to wait until we are ready to launch coordinated, sequential, and even possibly simultaneous counteroffensives so that the Germans cannot push their reserves to meet first one threat and then the other. This was a great trial for his subordinate commanders in the course of April, May, June and into July. That natural desire to launch counterattacks when they saw the local opportunity had to be held back. And many were criticising Foch because of his restraint. John Charteris, who had been Haig's Director of Military Intelligence, responded when he heard the news of the French counterattack on the Marne in mid-July Foch has scored because he correctly read German intentions, recognising that this was actually going to be the next point of attack and that the counterattack could now genuinely create the momentum for a sequence of offensives which would be sustained on the Western Front right up till the end of the war. On the 24th of July 1918, Foch convened a meeting at his headquarters at Bonbon of the commanders of the British French and American armies under his command. That is to say, Haig, Pétain and Pershing. He then sketched out to them a plan for the sequence of offensives which he now wished to launch. What the Allies now had were sufficient men, sufficient artillery, sufficient munitions to be able to launch attacks up and down the length of the Western Front without having to move resources to create local concentrations. Whereas the Germans, who are now running out of men, did have to move troops to meet those attacks 
and were increasingly running out of the reserves that would enable them to counter those attacks. So that's the essential vision that Foch brings to that. He also brings two other crucial elements to his proposals on the 24th of July. One is that now for the first time, he can set objectives which fulfill what we might call strategic goals. What he says the Allied armies have to do is to free up the railway lines to enable the maintenance of the offensive as the Allied armies advance. They need to capture railway stations. They need to liberate the communications. This is identifying objectives which will enable the maintenance of further advances. The second thing he stresses is the need to capture the resources that will underpin Allied industrial effort. When the Americans arrive en masse in France, which they do in 1918, they come without equipment. The men are more important because they're being equipped by the British and French. So British and French industrial production matters. And what Foch says is we need to secure the resources of northeastern France, which we lost in the opening weeks of the war in 1914. We need to get the coal, we need to get the iron ore, which will maintain French industrial production and therefore produce the goods which will deliver the victory which most people expect to come in 1919 or possibly not even until 1920. So here is a framework of operations with strategic objectives. Around that, there is an operational design, the ability to coordinate the components of an army, its artillery, its infantry, its tanks, the new weapon of the war, its air power, another new weapon of the war, in ways that can be applied simultaneously, a coordinated and joint battle. This is not Foch's monopoly. Other Allied armies realise that that is the stage that has been reached. Fighting depends on that coordination in order to ensure that the artillery opens the way for the infantry, the artillery then supports the infantry attack, that the tanks can, for example, provide the momentum by not just their pace, but their ability above all to cross trenches, crush wire, and to take out strong points which are preventing the infantry from advancing. In other words, to get infantry tanks and possibly air power to work in small groups together to help each other and give each other mutual support. The British expeditionary force that went to France in 1914 was, comparatively speaking, a diminutive army. The mobilised strength of the French or the German armies in 1914 was close to 3 million men. The British army, as it arrived in France in August 1914, mustered around 100,000 men, tiny by continental standards, and was divided into two corps. By 1915, it had expanded enough to be divided into separate armies. The army command within the British Expeditionary Force therefore became the important unit of senior command. In 1916, there are effectively five British armies on the Western Front. The first, second, third, fourth, and the Reserve Army. It's the Reserve Army that becomes the Fifth Army, which is broken in the major German offensive launched on the 21st of March 1918. From the remnants of the Fifth Army, a new Fourth Army is created and is put under Henry Rawlinson's command. This is the body which will be used in the Battle of Amiens. In the middle of July, on the back of a successful attack at Le Amel, Rawlinson had realised that he had a combined arms model for what we might think of as a constrained and limited battle, which could deliver results. The attack at Amel on the 4th of July 1918 had been a model battle of a limited variety, a battle which the Australians in particular had distinguished themselves, but also marked by the use of tanks and suggesting the potential of the tank in fighting in 1918. Rawlinson develops a plan of battle for application east of Amiens to clear the railway lines, to clear the threat which had been left as a result of the German offensive in March 1918. At the meeting at Bonbon, convened by Foch on the 24th of July 1918, Haig shows Foch Rawlinson's plan. 
Foch approves it and moreover responds to Haig's request that the French First Army under the command of General Debeny will combine with Rawlinson's Fourth Army in this battle. So the Battle of Amiens is an allied battle. This is the strength, of course, of having an allied commander-in-chief, that the resources can be committed to a joint action in this way. What the Battle of Amiens shows is that by 1918, the British army had reached a level of planning sophistication, which it had clearly lacked in 1916. It takes many years to generate staff officers and commanders, and the British army simply doesn't have enough in 1916 to be able to do staff work properly. By 1918, it's been able to remedy many of those deficits, so it has an effective staff and planning organisation. The planning for the Battle of Amiens takes three weeks, as opposed to the three months and more which the planning for the Battle of the Somme took. It's able to do that, partly because of mass, partly because the staff size has expanded, but also because there's a better understanding of what a First World War battle is, and of the role of the staff in terms of achieving the coordination of the different components of the army. The planning is done with immense secrecy. There are two difficult aspects to this. The long-term one is how do you deal with the artillery bombardment? On the Somme in 1916, it's a week-long bombardment. That gives the enemy plenty of time to realise that an attack is coming. The general view then was it was worth forfeiting surprise in order to get the destructive effect of the bombardment. Ironically, the artillery did not achieve the destructive effects in 1916 that it had hoped, and that's partly because the artillery itself is still not good enough to match the scale of the task that is confronting it. In 1918, the artillery is a much more sophisticated arm, much better able to deliver its shells on target, to identify its targets through reconnaissance, through techniques such as sound ranging, working out the range of where enemy batteries are through the sound that they generate as they fire and flash spotting, spotting the flashes from the muzzles of the guns as they fire their shells so that you can locate where enemy batteries are. This requires the remapping of France as the very first part of the process. So there's a surveying effort here as well as a technological effort in terms of the performance of the guns. The artillery preparation because it is more sophisticated in 1918, can also be shorter. Also, you have moved over to effective mass production of guns and shells. In August 1918, you don't need a long bombardment. You can achieve a surprise bombardment and you can achieve greater destructive effect because the guns are more accurately sighted and are able to fire with greater precision as a consequence. So the artillery bombardment can be left till the last moment. And then you can take out the targets you really want to take out, principally the German guns rather than German trenches or German infantry. We tend to think of the machine gun as the big killer for attacking troops in the First World War. And on the Somme in 1916, there's a lot of truth to that. Machine guns positioned in frontline trenches, able to be mounted by gun crews that have been down in deep dugouts, which can then fire to their left and right, swing the gun round to left and right, cutting down infantry in lines. Now the infantry are advancing not so much in lines, but in what are called blobs, small groups, less exposed to machine gun fire simply because of the way they're deployed. The big threat to them, certainly by 1918, is not so much the machine gun as artillery, because artillery in defence knows where its own side's positions are, knows where its own trenches are, and knows the killing points in which they can target the attacking infantry as it gets to those positions. So what you need to do if you're attacking is use your own artillery to take out the enemy's artillery. By 1918, you can do that much more effectively, principally because you can identify where the enemy batteries are positioned. So what you're getting is a coordinated effect between artillery and infantry that simply wasn't possible in 1916. And then, of course, you've got the tank. The other big concern in the lead up to the Battle of Amiens is not to give away 
to the enemy that the tanks are part of this battle. The tanks are brought up overnight, so they're not to be spotted from the air, aerial observation only being possible during the day. And everything is done to muffle the noise of the tanks advancing towards the front line because their engines are very noisy. The value of the tank is that as it advances across no man's land, what it can do is take out strong points like machine gun nests because the tank is essentially a mobile gun platform. We tend to think of the tank in terms of the Second World War as something that has quite high speed, maybe 25 miles an hour, that is capable of therefore manoeuvring to great effect, to exploit breakthrough and to advance quickly. The tank of 1918 is not the tank of 1940. Its average speed in most cases is two to three miles an hour because it's heavily armoured. The British have got light tanks by 1918, the Whippet tank, which does have a much greater speed and a greater cross-country performance. But the real challenge in the context of trench warfare is that there are so many obstacles on the battlefield. And one of the responses from the enemy to the capacity of a tank to cross a trench, of course, is to create a wider trench. So it's that much more difficult for the tank to cross the trench. And what happens with tanks in the Battle of Amiens is that they are very important on the 8th of August itself, but they then begin to suffer mechanical problems because the tank that is well protected is too heavy for the engine that is powering it. So by the second or third day, the rate of breakdown is very high. And indeed, for the rest of the fighting after the Battle of Amiens in August 1918, up until the armistice of November 1918, the tanks play a remarkably small role. Eric Ludendorff was the first quartermaster general of the German army in the German Supreme Command. That is to say, he was the principal sidekick to Paul von Hindenburg, who was the chief of the general staff. And both of them in the formal command structure are answerable to the Kaiser Wilhelm II, who is the supreme commander. Although in reality, he doesn't exercise supreme command because he's not up to the job. Ludendorff wrote his memoirs after the war in 1919 from exile in Switzerland. And in those memoirs, he described the Battle of the 8th of August 1918 as the Black Day of the German army. That, of course, has been picked up by British historians and indeed was picked up by British commentators and those who had served the moment it was published. It gave a tremendous sense of self-worth, understandably, to the British army and has enabled the British army to construct the Battle of Amiens as the turning point of the war. I think it's important to moderate that view in three ways. The first is to go back to Foch's intention at Bonbon. The Battle of Amiens is just one of a number of offensives that are launched up and down the front between August and November 1918. The battles which follow the 8th of August 1918 are therefore a sequence which, as Foch intended, pull German reserves from one sector of the front to the other, up and down the Western Front, as one battle follows another in very rapid succession. When Ludendorff remarked that the 8th of August was the black day of the German army, he immediately qualified that statement, if you read his memoirs, by saying, except, of course, for the collapse of Bulgaria on the Macedonian front at the end of September. To understand that, we need to recognise, first of all, that for all the success of the British and French armies and their allies on the Somme front on the 8th of August 1918, it does not in itself trigger a German request for an armistice. On the 14th of August, in the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Amiens, a Crown Council is convened at the German headquarters at Spa with the Kaiser in attendance. And the Austro-Hungarian chief of the general staff attends it. The Austrians are not playing any significant role on the Western Front. They have two divisions only, a nominal contribution. Their fronts are in Italy, Macedonia, and Russia. 
Art zu Strassenberg, the Austro-Hungarian chief of the general staff, says at that meeting, we need an armistice now. Austria-Hungary is exhausted. It has wanted a separate peace ever since 1917. Ludendorff will not concede that point. The Germans must go on fighting in order to succeed in negotiating a peace settlement. And the onus is now on politicians to think of a way out of this war short of an absolute and overwhelming German victory. Now, all that depends on the ability of the central powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, to hold all their fronts. Think of the central powers as exactly what that title suggests. They occupy the centre of Europe. They're geographically linked by land. They have railway communications that run from Berlin to Constantinople, from Berlin to Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, from Berlin to Vienna. That means that they can reinforce the independent fronts, west, east, and south, from this central position really quite easily. And that's what they've been able to do thus far in the war. When the Allied armies in Macedonia launch an offensive in the middle of September 1918, the Bulgarians immediately asked for reinforcements from Germany and Austria-Hungary. The response by Hindenburg and Ludendorff is, we can't do that. The major battle is being fought in France, and we need all the German divisions at least here. So they're not listening. They are therefore taken by surprise when within two weeks the Bulgarians seek an armistice and say they're dropping out of the war. This means the Balkan front has collapsed. And as the French commander in Macedonia sees it, there is an opportunity to push right into the heart of the central powers. He says, I shall be the first general to enter Vienna since Napoleon in 1809, and from Vienna then on to Berlin. The reality is the railway communications within the central powers are so exhausted by the strain they've been put under in this war, so overextended in terms of the range that they've had to run that they could not be used for a rapid penetration into the heart of the central powers in the winter of 1918-1919. But it's an indication of the shock effect of what has been achieved in the Balkans that Ludendorff uses this, the collapse in Macedonia, to say, now we must have an armistice and we must have it immediately. This entirely goes against the policy that he has espoused thus far of continuing fighting until they can negotiate a settlement. And indeed, the new German chancellor who takes office on the 1st of October, Max von Baden, makes exactly that point to Ludendorff. He says to him, I can't negotiate a peace settlement while you're telling me we have to seek an armistice. Ludendorff says, we simply cannot carry on fighting. That surprises many of his subordinates on the Western Front and on other fronts too, who do recognise that as the winter comes on, as the days get shorter, as the Allied communications become extended, as the roads begin to break up as the rain and then frost and snow descend, then the pace of their advance will slow. In many people's minds, there is still no prospect of achieving victory this year. The war is due to end in 1919, when the Americans can really be in Europe in great numbers. That's when the war will be won. So it comes only slowly to many commanders on the Allied side that they could win the war this year. Foch realises that the momentum is there, but he doesn't put a time on it. What happens as a result of the collapse of Bulgaria and the collapse in the Balkans is that the central powers collapse as an alliance. The Bulgarian armistice immediately leaves the Ottoman Empire exposed. It breaks the line of communications that runs from Berlin to Constantinople. Once the Allied armies, and that means particularly the French and the Serbs, are on the Danube, that is the main water route from Central Europe to the Black Sea and hence to the Ottoman Empire, broken. The breaking of those communications means that the Ottoman army can no longer be in contact with its other allies and can no longer be supplied by its other allies. It's on its own. The Ottomans realise at the beginning of October 
that if Bulgaria has sought an armistice, then it too must seek an armistice. So what happens from late September until mid-November 1918 is that the central powers, the enemy coalition breaks up first. None of Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria or the Ottoman Empire has any essential interest at stake on the Western Front. They've won their war. Russia's been knocked out. Romania's been knocked out. Italy was driven back to the River Piave at the end of 1917. Why should they carry on fighting? And Bulgaria shows that by coming out of the war the moment it is hit hard with the mid-September 1918 offensive. What is interesting is each of those decisions to stop fighting is taken independently. First, Bulgaria. Second, the Ottoman Empire. Third, Austria. Fourth, Germany. And fifth, Hungary. This happens while the alliance around Britain, France, the United States and their allies is cohering, particularly militarily, navally and economically. So this war is won as an alliance war. The Western Front matters most in 1918 because in the eyes of the allies, it is the arrival of the American Expeditionary Force that is going to win this war. And the Americans can only be delivered en masse in France. It's the point of nearest landfall from the United States. France has the ports big enough to take the arrival of the American Expeditionary Force, and it has the railways to take them from those ports to the front. It's also important that when America enters the war in April 1917, it took the decision simply to declare war on Germany. It did declare war on Austria-Hungary in December 1917, but it never declared war on Bulgaria or the Ottoman Empire. So the Western Front matters more than any other front. But when we think of the Hundred Days and when we think of the role of the Battle of Amiens, we should not forget that this is only one of several fronts. And those fronts all have interlocking effects. Some, particularly in Britain, see the Battle of Amiens as the decisive action of the First World War. That is to misunderstand the nature of the First World War as a conflict fought by many societies on multiple fronts. But Amiens did trigger a series of interlocking victories which brought an end to Germany's war in the West. That was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, Nicholas Rose stars in From Amiens to Armistice, A General Reflects, a drama based on the First World War diaries of General Lord Rawlinson, with thanks to the Churchill Archive Centre, Churchill College, University of Cambridge.